It's August 1st, 1960, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. It's perhaps unsurprising that one of the biggest hit singles of all time is a cover version. There are, after all, plenty of examples from pop history of an artist putting their own spin on a song and pushing it on to glories unmatched by the original. But it is, frankly, unsettling to discover that the iconic Let's Do the Twist by Chubby Checker, released on this day in 1960, is not so much a cover version more of an impersonation, a <laughs> cynical imitation of someone else's record to the extent that when the original singer, Hank Ballard, heard it on the radio, he thought it was him singing. <laughs> well, in fairness, Hank Ballard had already released it in 1959. And weirdly, this what turned into a global phenomenon began life as a B-side. It was the B-side to Teardrops on Your Letter by Hank Ballard and the Midnighters. And apparently Ballard had written the twist after seeing teenagers doing a new dance in Florida. And it peaked a modest 28 on the Billboard charts. But somewhere along the line, record executives spotted that there was a chance to turn this into the new dance craze. But not with Ballard, who was known for his sexually charged songs, which sometimes didn't even get airplay in conservative areas. For instance, he released a song called Sexy Ways in 1954. I mean, the problem with this story is that you start tugging at it a little bit and it all comes unstitched. You know, for example, Chubby Checker's first name isn't Chubby and his last name isn't Checker. No way. <laughs> so he was born in 1941 and he was the son of a tobacco farmer. Then when he was working as a teen at a produce store, he was given the nickname Chubby. That's how people used to act in the 50s. They would just do that to you. <laughs> <laughs> but he also had this really natural gift for imitation, and he enjoyed impersonating particularly the styles of his musical heroes, Fats Domino, Jerry Lee Lewis, and Elvis Presley. And that probably explains why he did such a good impersonation of Ballard when it came time for him to record the twist. Ernest Evans became Chubby Checker because he was mates with Dick Clark. Now, Dick Clark was the host of American Bandstand, which was the huge, massive show that every teenager in America watched, and specifically white teenagers watched, to get a sense of the sort of dancing they should be doing based on what African Americans were doing, who were either not allowed on telly in the kind of numbers to show the sort of dances they could replicate in the clubs or were deemed by producers not to be palatable to audiences across the country. Yeah, if you've seen Hairspray, American Bandstand is basically the Corny Collins show. Exactly, yeah. So, Dick Clark didn't want Hank Ballard on the show. We don't know why. Too sexy. Way too sexy. The reason that Ernest Evans came to his mind as someone who could sing this song was because... As a private Christmas gift that Dick Clark had sent round his mates, Ernest Evans had done impersonations of Elvis and the Chipmunks. So Dick Clark thought, I know who can do a good Hank Ballard, that young guy that did my Christmas card. <laughs> That's how this happened. And the version that I'd heard of how he got his name was nothing to do with serving customers because he was a bit fat. The version I'd heard was that Dick Clark's wife thought it would be a fun play on Fats Domino, Chubby Checker. It was as cynical as that. Yes, I heard that story as well as an explanation for the checker bit. So I think that she just managed to attach it to his nickname that was Chubby already. In, in any version, he's, he's being called fat. In any yeah. version. <laughs> but in any case, the support of Dick Clark ensured that Chubby Checker's cover of the twist was promoted extremely hard on his show. In a matter of weeks, it hit number one, which is actually quite impressive in those days. It was pretty common for singles to very slowly climb the charts as the yeah. airplay spread through the country. So to have it go to number one so quickly was actually really exciting. But you might think, well, hadn't the twist already been in the charts the previous year, albeit as a pretty moderate hit? But at the time, it was extremely common for multiple artists to release their version of a pop popular song, yeah. often at the same time. Sometimes multiple versions would be in the charts at the same time. Just because the concept of a singer, you know, sort of owning a song didn't really exist. I know, but like I said, to actually <laughs> literally say like, who's a guy that sounds exactly like people? Let's get my favourite impersonator. <laughs> yeah. Just impersonate Hank. I mean, I know Hank Ballard would have been crying all the way to the bank because obviously he got the songwriting royalties, but still, the versions were so close and Chubby Checker's version was so popular that Ballard actually re-recorded his version with a, a slightly different saxophone part so that it <laughs> sounded like Chubby Checker's. <laughs> it's like pop eating That's itself. Hilarious. And that version of the song ended up getting to number 28 on the pop charts. <laughs> It actually took a while before the dance was accepted across America because it was kind of associated as this 
kind of dance of degeneracy. And the New York Times had a column where they frankly fumed, instead of youth growing up, adults are sliding down. And you had this idea that the twist was involved in the growing immorality across the country, especially in the form of the Kennedys, who actually hosted twist parties at the White House. Even though I think now novelty dances, your mind goes to things like the conga or the macarena and they seem a bit naff. Dance crazes have actually been pretty controversial since they first appeared because for a long time, obviously, dancing was done in groups or with a partner. So there was really no way to do novelty steps. But then as the ragtime and jazz eras came around and you had freer styles of dancing, all these novelty dances came in, many of them for some reason that I'm not quite sure why, involved imitating animals. So some of the early ones were the turkey trot, the bunny hug, and the grizzly bear, in which you can see videos of people doing this online. Dancers <laughs> imitated a bear's heavy sideways steps and the way a bear's body oh, sways. that's a dance I could do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They were easy to do. They were fun. Disco you know, ruined you... everything for me. <laughs> I mean, if you're, if you're an average person who's been brought up dancing these quite staid Victorian partner dances or even the older group dances that you see in Jane Austen, they were so seen as quite racy and controversial the idea that you were doing all you know think of the charleston the charleston was controversial too and it was all about society moving away from really strictly choreographed dances to letting yourself go wild and also the fact that these were individual dances where the woman was no longer being led or pushed around by her male partner but it, you can see how it ties into the social revolutions that were going on at the time as well I mean, I don't want to, like, overly analyse a song as primal and silly as Let's Do The Twist. I think there is something in its brevity and its simplicity, come on, baby, let's do the twist, that basically Mm. just says, forget everything you know about learning dance styles. You can just move your body in a sexy way, and that is fun. Yes. Which, it's such a simple message, (laughs) but it's maybe the first time it had been said in quite so simple a way as the theme of a song. People had referenced in songs before dance moves that you do in particular parts of the song, but to have a song that is just, let's all do this thing now, (laughs) it's so base, (laughs) it's so straightforward. And I guess it also had an overtone of ballad's risque quality which was yeah let's have a shag is what it means yeah let's twist all night was pretty much what the song's about so a year after this moment chubby checker got back to number one with a second twist hit let's twist again and actually that's the one weirdly when you say the words the twist and chubby checker Mm. to me that's the one i'm singing in my head yeah me too let's twist again like we did last summer but actually that was literally it came out the summer after and he literally meant Let's do what we did to my novelty single 52 (laughs) weeks ago again. That's what it meant. (laughs) Well, Um, do you know the people couldn't get enough of it all over the world? Chubby Checker recorded it in German as Der Twist beginnt and in Italian as Baliamo il Twist. While in France, it was covered by Johnny Hallyday as Vie en danse le Twist. So people were really going for Let's Twist again. It is a better song though, isn't it? It It's a better song. It's more fun. Well, it's written by some of Elvis's songwriters. Uh, And interestingly, it has more Spotify plays these days than the original original even mm-hmm. though it's the original that then went back to number one which we'll get on to he did also record twist in usa and twist it up in the early 60s and he starred in two films one was called twist around the clock and the other one was called don't knock the twist <laughs> So this second rise to number one, that happened in January 1962, was driven by a totally different audience. So the kids who had originally loved the twist craze when it was new and fun had helped drive it to number one the first time. The second time, yeah, you had all this publicity in you know, the grown-up press about the twist. And Chubby Checker had appeared on the Ed Sullivan Show, which was watched by 10 million people, mm. most of them relatively conservative older people. Rock and roll had stopped being controversial. It's been so sanitised that it has been made palatable to middle-aged, middle-class audiences. Teens were over it. It was like Facebook, you know. Old Mm. people had started liking it. They were over it. But the power of, I guess, the grey dollar, 1962 was the twistiest year on record of the top... Right, I'll get this. (laughs) The top 100 (laughs) Billboard hits of 1962, yeah, include... Ten songs with the word twist in them. That means one-tenth of the hundred hot hits of 1962 were twist songs. Well, I'll tell you who else was over it after a while was Chubby Checker himself. He said that the song had become so ubiquitous that he felt that his critics thought that the only way that he was able to succeed was with dance and specifically twist-related records. And he later said, in a way, the twist really ruined my life. I was on my way to becoming a big nightclub performer and the twist just wiped it out. It got so out of proportion, no one ever believes that I have talent. I get the impression he's one of those performers because he's still alive. You can still go and see him touring. But he does basically. 
<laughs> that would be brilliant, wouldn't it? Imagine you went to see Jumpy Jack and he didn't do either Let's Do The Twist or Let's Twist Again. Here's one from my new album. Yeah. <laughs> Tomorrow. And then with a final flourish, she personally would behead the nobles with her own axe. Love the show? Support the show. Patreon.com slash Retrospectors. Part of the ACAST Creator Network.